Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the spinal cord, the brain, cranial nerves a little bit, and the reflex arc, and the neuron. So we're going to start with uh, the brain. And let's just give you a little bit of an intro to the neural system. And the neural system is a really, really interesting uh, system. It, it develops at around day 18 to 21, somewhere around there after sperm and egg come together at conception. Um, it is the first system that develops. Um, many students think that it is the heart that is the first organ and the cardiovascular system that is the first system that develops due to the importance of blood supply uh, to the body. However, it starts out with something embryologically that is referred to as the notochord. Uh, and before it's the notochord, it's actually something called the primitive streak. So it's the primitive streak becomes the notochord, and then it becomes the spinal cord, the brain and the spinal cord. So that's really the very, very first thing that develops in a uh, baby. And the neural system, the brain and the spinal cord is also referred to as the CNS, which is the central neural system. Central neural system is only the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral neural system, which is the PNS, is everything but the brain and the spinal cord. So anything that is an extension of the brain or, or anything that is an extension of the spinal cord is referred to as the peripheral neural system. So again, brain, spinal cord, CNS, central neural system, anything that extends off of that would be the peripheral neural system. So any nerve that comes off the spinal cord, like your spinal nerves, or any nerve that comes off the brain, like your cranial nerves, would have to be peripheral neural system, CNS and PNS. You'll also learn a little bit about the autonomic neural system being sympathetics and parasympathetics. Sympathetics being your fight or flight response, which can be found between T1 and L2. So they call it the thoracolumbar outflow or thoracolumbar output. And that is your fight or flight response. Whereas the parasympathetic is known as the craniosacral outflow or craniosacral output because it's cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, 10, cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, 10, and sacral segments, S2, three, and four. S2, three, and four. So cranial nerves three, seven, nine, 10, and sacral segment S2, three, four makes up the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest system or feed and breed. One would, could be considered as the accelerator and one is the brake. So fight or flight is the accelerator and then feed or breed, rest and digest is the brake. Sympathetics tend to speed things up, like increase your heart rate, to increase your respiration, whereas parasympathetic would slow down your rate of breathing, slow down your heart rate. So sympathetics would be more of the accelerator, parasympathetic more of the brake, except when it comes to digestion, it reverses itself. Uh, you want to be able to digest a meal when you're relaxed. Not when everything is, not when you're exercising in a stressed state where your heart is pounding and you, you're anxious and you're breathing real quick, that's sympathetic. So this is why grandma or mom would tell you, don't eat and then go out and play because you'll get a bellyache. It's, it's for that reason. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at the brain here and what you'll see is that you have to be able to identify front and back foremost. And here we're looking at a lateral view. And you'll see back here on the bottom and the back is the cerebellum. 
So once you see the cerebellum, which we call the little brain, that's on the posterior part. And that's where your occiput is or the occipital lobe, the green section. On the opposite side here in the front is your frontal lobe. Everything from here to this red strip is frontal lobe. And then everything from the blue strip back to here is your parietal lobe. And then here is your temporal lobe. And way in the back is your occipital lobe. So everything that you're seeing here, with the exception of the cerebellum, will we'll exclude that. But everything else, these are different lobes of your cerebrum, your cerebrum. So let's not confuse cerebrum with the cerebellum. Cerebellum, entirely different uh, structure and has entirely different function. Your frontal lobe from an emotional perspective uh, is your driver. It is what is responsible for your ambition, for your drive, for your goals. Uh, when you're motivated to go and accomplish things, that is a healthy frontal lobe. When you lack ambition and you lack goals and you don't have the ability to plan out one's life, that is a problem with the frontal lobe when there are people who have difficulty in understanding that there's consequences for actions, this is a problem with the frontal lobe. Meaning someone accidentally, let's say they're driving their car and someone's in their blind spot, right? They don't necessarily, and they don't look over their shoulder and they're about to change lanes and the person honks them. That person may have thought that the person was intentionally cutting them off and being disrespectful when in fact it could be a 95 year old grandpa or grandma that has difficulty in turning their neck couldn't see well enough and these are accidents happen right and that person gets this road rage and they follow that person for miles right just to curse them out or something um that's an individual that has a frontal lobe problem. It's dysfunctional. So they don't rationalize properly. Most criminals, most murderers, most people that commit crimes, these are people that have frontal lobe issues thinking, I don't think I'm going to get caught. It'll be someone else. It won't be me. Um, bad frontal lobes. Okay. So help, uh, healthy frontal lobe is... I'm in this class, I want to do well, I want to, I want to process the information, I want to execute, I have goals, I want to get into healthcare. A frontal lobe that isn't very healthy is, I'll, I'll sign up for the class, I'll show up maybe once, maybe twice, and uh, I'll roll the dice and see where the, you know, that's not a well healthy frontal lobe. Students are paying good money and not, not good, okay? So having a healthy frontal lobe, good higher executive order thinking, responsible, um, not living in a basement till you're 70 years old playing Xbox, right? That would be an unhealthy frontal lobe. The parietal lobe, when we look at this right here, the parietal lobe is more about your perception how you perceive yourself and how you see yourself. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a patient that said to me, Dr. Lindner, look at my left ankle. Look how fat and swollen it is. And I look at the left ankle, I compare it to the right. They look the same to me. I do not see what the patient sees. And I'll say to them, you know, to me, it looks the same but let's measure it, okay? Now, either my perception is off and I'm seeing them perfectly even, left and right ankles, they look the same size, or the patient's parietal lobe is off and they're perceiving different sides of their body to look different, right? BID. 
BID, right? Body image disorder. So I said, why don't we measure it? So I take a tape measure, I go around the left ankle, I go around the right ankle, I show the patient that we are going around the exact same landmarks and I have the patient read me the numbers. Let's go to the left ankle. We go around, can you tell me what number you see? They say, oh, it looks like it says 12. Okay, so you have 12 inches on the left, the girth around the ankle. Let's go around the same area, medial lateral malleolus on the right side. What do you have on the right side? Can you re read that number to me? What does it say? Oh, it too says 12. Okay, so now I try and use rationale and objective tools. So I would say to the patient, does it seem safe to rationalize that if your left one reads, you said 12, inches and the right one reads 12 inches, that they're the same. And you see this struggling look on their face initially. And they say, yeah, yeah. I go, okay, so they're the same. But, but doc, but, but, but doc, but look, but, but look, right? So it's telling me that they're inside their world, they're seeing things different. They perceive things different. And we all know this to be true, right? I mean, you can watch a movie that you love. Someone else watches the same movie and they go, this is horrible and they wanna walk out. You can hear some music that you love or an artist that you love and someone else hears it on iTunes or the radio and they go, oh, turn that off. That's not even music, right? So everyone's perception is different. It just means that there are these imbalances in the parietal lobe. And remember, you have two hemispheres of the brain. When we look at the brain, we do have two hemispheres, a left and right hemisphere of the brain. So information is coming in from half your body going to one side and the other half going to the other. And it can really distort things in the wiring. So in the parietal lobe, I wanna show you that there's something called a homunculus. And what you can see here, this is a bird's eye view, looking down, looking at the left cerebrum and the right cerebrum. And again, you see this red area and you see this blue area. And if we go back and we look at the brain, we'll see we have a red area and we have a blue area. This red area is called the pre-central gyrus, and the blue area is called the post-central gyrus, pre and post-central gyrus. This groove separating the two is called a sulcus. It's actually called the central sulcus. And the central sulcus is a landmark that separates the central sulcus is a landmark that separates the pre-central gyrus from the post-central gyrus. The pre-central gyrus is where all of your motor messages start and your post-central gyrus is where all of your sensory input ends, meaning that your spinal cord is a highway of communication. Think of the, high, the spinal cord as having two elevators, two tracks that the elevators ride. One goes up and one goes down, right? These tracks go up and down. They go up to the brain and they can go from the brain down. They go up and down. When information goes into the brain, that's sensory input coming in. When information exits the brain and goes down the spinal cord, down the elevator to all the body parts and muscles and organs, that's motor information. So there's sensory and motor information. Sensory information goes up, motor information goes down. The other name for sensory information, since it goes up, we say it ascends. And since motor information goes down, we say it descends. So we have ascending information and descending 
information. The ascending information, the sensory information is also called afferent input, afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, afferent. The motor information that's going down the spinal cord that's descending is called efferent information, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, efferent information. So we have afferents and efferents. Afferent is sensory, efferent is motor. So the precentral gyrus is your, mo is your motor output region. They sometimes call this somatic motor. And then the postcentral gyrus is sensory. They call it somatic sensory. Okay. So now when we look at the homunculus, what I want you to see is that the precentral and postcentral gyrus, if we look at it in this cross section, has representation of every single body part on both the somatosensory side or the postcentral gyrus or the motor side here for the precentral gyrus. So that your fingers and your hands and your face occupy a lot of brain geography, right? They take up a lot of brain space because the fingers are highly sensitive in terms of sensory, but you can also move your fingers in a very fine coordinated way. You can move your lips, you can move your eyes in very controlled manner. From a sensory perspective, we know how sensitive your lips are. We know how sensitive the fingertips are. You can close your eyes, have something in your hand and try and figure out what it is through your tactile senses, not because your fingers are feeling it. It's not your fingers that do any of the feeling. It's your brain that does all the feeling. And now you know where it does the feeling in the postcentral gyrus. The fingers just have the receptors. They receive the information. They have receptors for hot, for cold, for sharp, for dull, for pain, right? They have receptors, but it's the brain that actually feels the pain. In terms of your eyes for vision, your eyes don't do any seeing. The eyes have receptors. It's the brain that does the seeing. That's a really important concept. In terms of motor, in terms of movement, we know that you can move your pinky ever so slightly. And because that requires such fine motor skill, the hand and the fingers occupy a lot of brain space. But look at the trunk, look at the knee, right? If you look at the larger parts of the body, they don't occupy as much space. You would think that the thigh that has the quadriceps and the hamstrings because they're immense muscles, that they would occupy so much brain space, but they just don't. It's the body parts that regulate more precision and control that occupy a lot of brain space in both the sensory and motor component. So this is referred to as the homunculus. Okay, so we covered the frontal lobe, we did the parietal lobe. The occipital lobe is where your visual center is. Again, like I said, your eyes only have receptors for vision, but it's your brain, especially in the occipital lobe in the backside that does the seeing. If someone accidentally slips and falls on black ice in the winter and they hit the back of their head on concrete, they can go blind. Nothing happened to the eyes, to the receptors, but the visual cortex in the back can become distorted. Now we know that the brain does the seeing, right? I mean, you can close your eyes and I can say to you, think of a yellow banana, think of a gray elephant. And with your eyes closed, you can get the image because it's in your brain already. You've already seen it. Temporal lobe, deals more with auditory, right? That's where the ears are. So a lot of the auditory components are found in the temporal lobe. 
Okay, let's look, let me go back to the beginning slide now. And now that we know some of the main lobes of the brain, now let's look at some of the hills and some of the valleys, right? We have these hills and valleys. Now, what's really interesting is if you look at the brain, it kind of looks like the intestines, right? If you go to Google images or you just look at the small intestines, it really does look like this. And that's why you hear of something referred to as the brain gut connection. There is an incredible connection between the brain and the gut. And you, again, you may know that in some degree. You may know that if you're anxious before a test, you may be running to the bathroom. You may know that if you're depressed and sad and just clinically depressed, your bowel movements don't really happen. They're depressed too, right? You become constipated with depression. You'll end up with diarrhea, with anxiety. The brain-gut connection. Embryologically, they're derived from the same tissue. And you have lots of serotonin receptors, not just in the brain, right? Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, but you have lots of serotonin receptors. In fact, probably eight to nine times as much in the intestines. And that's involved with a lot of IBS, right? With irritable bowel syndrome, we see a lot of issues with serotonin uh, imbalances. So the brain-gut connection, very important. And you'll see another main connection between the brain and the gut is actually the highway of one major cranial nerve. That major cranial nerve is the vagal nerve or the vagus nerve. And that's cranial nerve number 10. The vagal nerve goes from the gut to the brain. And this is why when I'm working with my patients and I, they'll ask me, do you think it's good for me to eat this food? Should I have this food? And I'll say, what's your mood after the food, right? If it makes you energetic, makes you feel good, then it may be a good food. If it makes you tired, exhausted, depressed, don't eat that food. The gut gives off a lot of chemical messengers, right? We have lots of bacteria in the gut. It's called a microbiome. And the microbiome gives off chemical messages that go to the brain. And it can give some people brain fog and they can become forgetful. Certain things make them cl clear. They, they increase their clarity, like coffee to many people, increases the clarity of the brain and makes it sharper. Now that's not because of adrenaline and caffeine. That used to be the old thought. The new way of thinking is that coffee creates a certain strain of bacteria in the gut and that bacteria creates a chemical message that makes the brain more alert. Again, it's this um, uh, microbiome that has such incredible uh, important functions. It probably deserves a chapter unto itself in anatomy and physiology books. We just haven't gotten there yet. But in healthcare, there's lots of new incredible information in relationship to the microbiome. Okay, so now we see the hills that are called gyrus and the valleys are called sulcus. These are called sulcus. From this view, you can see the pre-central gyrus, the post-central gyrus, right, gyrus. And then here is the central sulcus. Since that's the central sulcus, there's the pre-central gyrus and post-central gyrus. You can see the two hemispheres. Uh, here's the translucent skull. So we see a left cerebral hemisphere and a right cerebral hemisphere. Notice it's the word cerebral, so not to be confused with cerebellum, because the cerebellum has a left and right cerebellar hemisphere whereas the cerebrum has a left and right cerebral hemisphere. Their functions are slightly different. Your left hemisphere is mostly related to linear thinking like science and math and logic and language. That's all left brain. Your right 
brain is related to more of your creative thinking, more of the artistic side, more of the musical side, more of spatial relationships, more of, hmm, does this shirt go with this pants? Does that match? Can I put this couch over here with this picture frame in my home? Does this go together, right? That's more right-sided. Facial recognition is right side brain. Uh, when a baby is looking at their mother or father or caretaker and the baby cries, it may be because they're seeing a strange face and they don't feel the comfort of their mother or father. Um, when they look at eyes and they see wide eyes, not smiling eyes, they can cry, right? So the baby's right brain is, is very well developed. It needs to be. And the left brain will slowly catch up, right? So you have left and right brains that have very, very different functions. And this is why if someone has a stroke and they have lack of glucose or oxygen to a particular part of the brain, if they lose their ability to speak, we know the stroke was on the left side of the body. If all of a sudden the person starts dressing in a manner where they're wearing stripes uh, with, with a nut, with striped shirt, with a striped tie and striped pants, and they're all different, you know, colors and shapes and they never did that before, then we could agree that maybe the lesions on the right hemisphere. Okay. When we look at the brain, there is gray matter and white matter. Now white matter means that it was myelinated. It was protected by cholesterol and fat, which is myelin and in the neural system, we have two main types of cells. We have neurons and we have neuroglial cells. The neuron is electrically excitable. It's the only cell that is electrically excitable. And the neuroglial cells or neuroglial cells are supporting cells to the neural system. And one of those cells, myelinates the neural system in the CNS and another type of cell myelinates in the PNS. In the CNS, we call it an oligodendrocyte. In the PNS, we call it a Schwann cell. So Schwann cells myelinate the neural system in the peripheral neural system, whereas oligodendrocytes myelinate in the central neural system. And again, myelin, I want you to think of myelin if I if you see this electrical cord, right? You don't see the actual wires. You see this black protective layering. The black layering would be myelin. If I took a knife and I started to fray the insulation away, then I can see the, the wires in between. And if I touch it, I could get shocked. So the purpose of myelin is to insulate and to speed up the action potentials or the nerve conduction. And when the body creates antibodies against the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes, and they can no longer produce myelin, we call that multiple sclerosis or MS. And typically the first signs of MS, they show up in the eyes as visual disturbances of some sort. So here in the outside of the brain, we have a region called the cerebral cortex. And on the inside, we have white matter. So the cerebral cortex is gray matter. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree right? The outside of the tree is the bark and that's what protects the tree. This is the cortex. The inside of the brain is myelinated. That is white matter. And what's important to understand is that in the spinal cord, it does just the opposite. In the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside 
and the gray matter is on the inside. It does a complete flip-flop. And we'll show you that when we cover the lecture on the spinal cord. So here is another view of the brain. And you could see again, gray matter is on the outside and that's the cerebral cortex. Down here on the bottom is the cerebellum. This is the cerebrum, both hemispheres. And you could see in the middle is the white matter. Now, when we look at the brain, we could see the two hemispheres and right down the center where the um, sagittal suture would be, right, in the bone, here is the longitudinal fissure. And this is what kind of separates both hemispheres from one another. Now, when I say separate, I've dissected brains before. I held brains in my hands and I played around with these tissues. You can't really pull apart the left and the right uh, cerebral hemispheres. You can separate them a little bit with your fingers, but the brain doesn't pull apart. You actually have to use a blade to separate and pull apart both uh, cerebral hemispheres. So this is the longitudinal fissure. In the skull, here is the skull. We've just taken off part of it that's protecting one of the hemispheres. You can see these blue structures. These blue structures are part of the venous system, which you'll go over in more detail in AMP2 when you learn about the drainage of deoxygenated blood from the brain, we want that blood to drain into the neck and find a way back into the heart. So we want the deoxygenated blood to go to the heart so that the heart pumps it to the lungs where it can pick up oxygen and become oxygenated blood again. So let's just get familiar with some of these, but you'll see them again in, in um, in AMP2, up here superiorly is the superior sagittal sinus. Below that is the inferior sagittal sinus. Here is the straight sinus, and here is the transverse sinus. Here. When we look at the brain and we rotate it looking at a posterior view, here is the green is the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. This is where your visual cortex is, the primary cortex, as well as the association cortex. But down here is the cerebellum. And what separates the cerebrum, especially the occipital lobe, from the cerebrum is going to be the transverse fissure here and here, the transverse fissure. What separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum is a membrane called the tentorium cerebelli. It's this clear translucent membrane that separates cerebellum from cerebrum. And it would be where that transverse fissure is. That's where we would see this membrane. Now here again is the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus. And then there's the central sulcus that we see on both sides. It's this deep depression that goes all the way through. So from the lateral view, right? Here's the lateral view. We can see the central sulcus here. We can see the lateral sulcus. The lateral sulcus is what separates the temporal lobe from the parietal lobe. When we turn the brain upside down and we look at it from the inferior view, all of these yellow structures are cranial nerves and there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The two biggies that are pretty large and easy to see here are cranial nerves one and two. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory, which deals with the sense of smell, which is here. And then cranial nerve two is the optic nerve that we can see here. 
And there's a right one and there's a left one. And where they crisscross, where they make an X and they crisscross is called the optic chiasm. And right here is a gland that comes into very, very close contact with the optic nerve. The name of this gland is called the pituitary gland. When the pituitary gland gets enlarged, it can put pressure on the optic nerves and people can get these visual disturbances. And sometimes a person can go blind in the right eye. They can go blind in the left eye. They can go blind on the right side of both eyes, the left side of both eyes, the outside of both eyes, or the inside of both eyes. It can really change depending on where the pituitary gland is putting pressure on the optic nerves. But you'll have half of your eye, half of the information that's coming from your right eye, that information goes to the right occipital lobe and some of it crosses over to the left occipital lobe. And the same thing is true with the left eye. Some information from the left eye goes to the left um, occipital lobe and some of it crosses over to the right occipital lobe. So we have crisscross talk within our brain. The cranial nerves one through 12, they are numbered in order that the body develops them. So cranial nerve one is the first one that develops your sense of smell. Cranial nerve two is the second word, the second cranial nerve that develops the optic nerve for vision. And they go all the way to 12. So cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. Cranial nerve three is the olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. Cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve six is the abducens nerve. And in the word abducens, you can hear the word abduct. So it moves the eye away from midline. Cranial nerve seven, facial nerve or facial expression. It moves all the muscles of the face. Cranial nerve eight, vestibulo cochlear. And when we look at the ear, you'll see vestibular portion and the cochlear portion of the ear. One controls balance, one controls hearing. So it's one cranial nerve that act actually divides and has two divisions, vestibular cochlear, that's cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal nerve. Glosso is tongue, pharyngeal is pharynx, so glossopharyngeal nerve. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagal nerve or vagus nerve. And that vagal nerve makes up about 90% of the parasympathetics. That's how important that vagal nerve is. It makes up 90% of the parasympathetics. Cranial nerve 11 is the spinal accessory nerve. And cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal. So those are the 12 cranial nerves. They come in pairs, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And they all come off of different parts of the brain. And I'll explain what parts of the brain these cranial nerves come from when I can, can show you all parts of the brain coming up. Okay, so we did go over the different lobes already of the cerebrum. We already explained that this red strip is the precentral gyrus, which is also the primary motor area. And that is associated with the frontal lobe. And there's also a somatic motor association area. So this is the main strip. And then, uh, you know, you have some synergistic effects coming from here as well. It's an association area. Most parts of the brain do have an association area. Even on the sensory side where the blue strip is, the postcentral gyrus, your primary sensory area. And then just behind it, you have some other uh, somatosensory association areas. And that's part of the parietal lobe. 
Back here is the occipital lobe, and we said that's your visual cortex. And then here is the visual association area. So just to give you an idea as to how these association areas work. Um, right now, your optic nerves are working and they're sending signals so you can see something on the screen and you can also see me. But those signals are sent to an association area which then interprets that information and says, what I am seeing is the brain. What I'm seeing is Dr. Linder, right? So it takes the information, processes it, and just refines it a little bit. That's the significance of these association areas. When we look at the temporal lobe, this is more for auditory input. So we have on top the auditory cortex and then the auditory association area. Again, the same thing. Right now you can hear my voice. You're saying, I hear someone speaking. I can hear something. That's the auditory cortex. But now it processes it to the auditory association area. And you could say, hmm, I recognize that voice. That sounds like Dr. Lindner's voice. Or you hear a song on the radio. You can hear it, you go, ah, it's a song. And then you're trying to go, who sings that? Let me see if I can recognize the voice that would send it to the auditory association area. When we pull the temporal lobe down, we could see a little bit of the deeper part of the brain in here called the insula. This orange section is called the insula. When we separate the brain and we look at from the inside of the hemisphere, we can see this region here is the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a bunch of axons that connect both hemispheres together. So they go transversely from right to left hemisphere. Women tend to have a much stronger and larger connection within the corpus callosum than do men. There's a much stronger wiring anatomically connecting left and right hemisphere. The septum pellucidum here is a membrane that separates the two ventricles, the lateral ventricles they are called. And I will show you what the ventricular system looks like because there are four ventricles, but lateral ventricle one and two one of the lateral ventricles is in the right cerebral cortex. And then the other lateral ventricle would be on the other half of the brain, not shown in this picture, which would be the left cerebral cortex. So this membrane here, the septum pellucidum, is what separates the two ventricles from one another, the two lateral ventricles from one another. Down here is a region called the fornix. And we'll also go through what these areas are down below. So again, on another view, here's the corpus callosum. Here is the septum pellucidum, which is what separates the lateral ventricles, the left and the right, or lateral ventricle one and two from one another. And then below that is the fornix. This is your cerebrum right here. This large section is the cerebrum. There's the frontal lobe, there's the occipital lobe, up here is the parietal lobe. Over here is the cross section of the cerebellum. And then here we have three other regions, the medulla, which is down here, the medulla, this round circle here, this is called the pons. And then this section right here, I'm going across it with my uh, cursor right in here. This is the midbrain. So you have the, the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Cerebellum is back here. Cerebrum is up here. And everything in the center is called the diencephalon. When you hear the diencephalon, you're going to hear terms like thalamus and hypothalamus and epithalamus. That's all in the center of the brain. So now here's your olfactory nerve. We turn the brain upside down and now we see these two cavities. 
these two cavities here and here is where the lateral ventricles sit. So let me see if I have the picture of the ventricles here and then we'll come back. I'm just, there it is. Okay, so here are the ventricles. So here are the lateral ventricles. You can see one here on this side, one here on this side. So lateral ventricle one and two, third ventricle and fourth ventricle. So these two parts here and here, each of these lateral ventricles are going to sit, again, both of these lateral ventricles are going to sit in that cavity here and here. Okay, so it's deep in the brain. And what separates the two is the septum pellucidum. It's like a wall that separates the two. Okay, so we're still looking at the sagittal view. Here is the corpus callosum up here. Here's the septum pellucidum. Here's the fornix. Now this central structure is the thalamus. The significance of the thalamus is that it is the relay station for all the sensory input coming into the brain. So we have information coming up the highway, right? It ascends, it comes up through the medulla, through the pons, through the midbrain and makes a pit stop here in the thalamus. And the thalamus has so many different nuclei within it, which are these relay centers. And it'll say, okay, you're gonna go to the post-central gyrus, this specific part. And it's gonna be able to tell you that you have an itch on the right side of your neck, right? It's gonna tell you that um, there's painful stimulus to the left shoulder, right? So that information is relayed to the thalamus first. The center where it looks like the egg yolk right here, that has a unique term called the interthalmic, interthalmic adhesion, interthalmic adhesion. Okay, so here was the thalamus. Here's the interthalamic adhesion. Below the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus has major function. It is closely related to the autonomic neural system, to the ANS. It is the control center of the ANS. The ANS is the autonomic neural system, which is composed of the sympathetics and parasympathetics. Sympathetic is your thoracolumbar outflow or output. Parasympathetic is the craniosacral output. Sympathetics goes from T1 to L2. Parasympathetic is cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, 10, and sacral segment S234. Parasympathetic is rest and digest or feed and breed. Sympathetic is fight or flight response. The hypothalamus also controls your anger. It also controls uh, arousal when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, your satiety center is in the hypothalamus. So it's a really, really important uh, part, thalamus and hypothalamus. So again, in this view here, this round section here would be the thalamus. That little brown circle would be the interthalmic adhesion. So below the thalamus is the hypothalamus, which is this region. Now the hypothalamus is closely connected to the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus has an extension connecting to the pituitary gland called the infundibulum. The infundibulum is the stalk or the connection leading to the pituitary. The pituitary gland sits in that cella tersica, also known as the hypophyseal fossa. When you get into AMP2, you will learn that the pituitary has two divisions, an anterior division and a posterior division. And the anterior division is called the adenohypophysis, whereas the posterior division is called the neurohypophysis. 
And in the word neurohypothesis and adenohypothesis is the word hypothesis. And we know it sits in the hypophyseal fossa. Okay. Let's not confuse the pituitary gland with what's back here, which is the pineal gland. The pineal gland is above the cerebellum, right? It's right there, that's the pineal. The pineal gland uh, secretes and releases um, something called melatonin. So here is the pineal gland. Again, let me just review a few structures. Here is the corpus callosum septum pellucidum, fornix, thalamus, interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus, choroid plexus. This is involved with the ventricles. The choroid plexus is involved in producing cerebral spinal fluid. It's a capillary system. It's highly lined with ependymal cells that produce cerebral spinal fluid. The pineal gland is back here. This is the medulla. This is the pons. And then right here is the midbrain. You see these two bumps right here? These two bumps, this is the superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. That is part of the midbrain. And I'll show you the superior and inferior colliculus by taking this brain and rotating it so we can see it from the posterior a little bit better. Okay, here's a close up of what we've covered. So here's the corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, fornix. Choroid plexus produces CSF, pineal gland, thalamus, interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus. Here are the three main sections of the brain stem. So this is the brain stem made up of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Medulla, pons, midbrain. The medulla extends down below the magnum foramen of the skull and is protected by the top two vertebrae in the neck, C1 and C2. The medulla is where the nuclei of cranial nerves 8 through 12 lie. So cranial nerve 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, the nuclei begin here in the medulla. In the pons, it's cranial nerve 5, 6, and 7 cranial nerve five, six, and seven. In the midbrain, it's cranial nerve three and four. So you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And in the cerebrum, it's cranial nerve one and two, right? When we took the brain and we looked at it from the underneath surface, we saw the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve one. And we saw the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. In the midbrain is three and four, which is olfactory nervous three, trochlear nervous four. In the pons, we have five, six, and seven. Trigeminal nerve is five, abducens is six, facial nerve is seven. So you have five, six, and seven. And in the medulla, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, eight is the vestibular cochlear, nine is the glossopharyngeal, 10 is the vagus nerve, 11 is the spinal accessory, and 12 is the hypoglossal. Why is that important to know? Well, it's important to know clinically, right? If someone has head trauma and we think they have a concussion and all of a sudden the heart rate is going crazy, their digestion's going crazy, we would say, well, medulla controls that because of cranial nerve 10 which goes to the stomach, it goes to the heart, it goes to the intestines, it goes to the pancreas, it goes everywhere. That's why the vagal nerve, cranial nerve 10, controls 90% of the parasympathetic. If someone is having trouble, if they get head trauma and all of a sudden they can't move the facial muscles, they can't raise the eyebrows, they can't really move the lips around too much, 
then the problem is in the pons because pons is five, six, and seven, and facial expression is cranial nerve seven. Okay. If they're having trouble moving the eye in a particular direction, midbrain controls eye movement. It's cranial nerve three and four. If they're having trouble with smell, that's the olfactory nerve. Could be a problem in the cerebrum. So knowing that cranial nerves originate in very specific locations within the brain, it's really important to test these cranial nerves, especially after head trauma, and it can help identify where the lesion is in the brain. Okay, close up view of the brain stem again, medulla, pons, and the midbrain. When we take this section, this is only half from the sagittal view, but we take left half and right half, right? Here's half and here's half, and we put it together. Here's the medulla, here's the pons, and here's the midbrain. If we go back here and I go, see these two bumps? That's the superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. Well, you have two bumps on half, this half of the brain, and you have the other two bumps on the other half of the brain. So here are the two bumps on half, and here are the two bumps on the other half. All together, we have four bumps. That's why it's called quadrigemina. Quad means four. Corpora means body. So this is the body of four. Corpora quadrigemina that's made up of two superior colliculi and two inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi are involved in moving the eyes and the inferior colliculi are involved with auditory information that you receive. So as your eyes are scanning or reading paper, reading words on a paper, that's the superior colliculus. The inferior colliculus, like if you hear a loud bang, it involves hearing it, moving your head to see what it is, covering and protecting your head, but it involves all that auditory input is required that's more of the inferior colliculus response. The pons is more involved in controlling your respiration, like the rate and rhythm of your breathing. And the medulla is where the cardiovascular center lies. So people that have blood pressure issues, that's the medulla, okay? Now you heard me say that cranial nerve 10 originates in the medulla, which is the vagal nerve. You also heard me say that the C1 vertebrae and C2 protect the medulla. So now you think about babies being born today and the amount of force that's used at times to pull a baby out of the vaginal canal during the delivery and the amount of rotation to the cervical spine, they'll take the cervical spine, they'll rotate it only so that the shoulders rotate so that the baby's in alignment with the vaginal canal and the baby can be birthed. So the shoulders don't hit the pelvic brim, there's no block. When that happens and there's forceful rotation, the atlas can subluxate. It can misalign and create neurological interference at the level of the medulla, compromising the neural integrity going to the digestive tract of the baby. Now the baby is trying to breastfeed, the baby's trying to eat, and the baby can't hold down the food because the valves going from the esophagus to the stomach won't open and close properly due to vagal nerve irritation. The vagal nerve goes to the digestive tract. So as the fluid is going down, if the valve to the stomach can't open, it just comes back out again and there's projectile vomiting. And that can be pretty forceful. So this is where these babies need to get checked for the integrity of what's happening at the C1, C2 level of the neck. And over the years, you know, 25 years I've been in practice, I've had several hundreds and hundreds of babies that were brought to me for that exact reason. There was traumatic birth and the babies weren't thriving and there was incredible misalignment of the atlas of the C1 creating neurological compromise, creating so many imbalances. 
right? We can see a lot of these um, complications at birth. Sometimes the blockage or interference could be where the cranial nerves are and you start to see infants or babies with deviating eyes, right? One eye that comes this way, one eye that goes this way, right? When sometimes those children grow up as adults and they have eyes that fail to go straight ahead, but a drifting eye, that's from neurological output. When there is an imbalance to neurological output to the eye muscles, right? We've done the eye muscles already, cranial nerve three and four, right? Cranial nerve three and four, like six, cranial nerve six goes to the abducens. That brings the eye out. So if there's lack of output to the lateral rectus muscle of the eye, which is the abducens nerve, cranial nerve six, you can't move the eye out, boom, the eye goes in. You don't have an opposing muscle to pull it out. So you get a drifting eye going in. This can happen from birth trauma. So um, really important to understand how neurology relates to overall function. And some of the early signs can be picked up right at delivery. Think of the APGAR scoring, right? Many students are getting into nursing here when a baby's born and they're checking the APGAR score, they're checking for heart rate. They're checking that the baby have a bowel movement. They're checking to the baby P. This is all autonomic nervous system function. Okay, um, here is the medulla, here's the pons, and here's the midbrain section. Here are the medullary pyramids, and here are the cere cerebral peduncles. I won't ask you any functional questions on those, more just structural questions. Here's your cerebellum. Notice two L's, cerebellum. Cerebellum is really important for balance and the coordination of your movements. So for example, if I take my finger and I close my eyes and I hit the very top of my tip of my nose and I could do the same with my other finger, that's a very healthy healthy cerebellar function with my eyes closed. Now I test this on my patients so I know how to treat them. And I'll say, eyes closed, touch your finger to the very tip of the nose. And I'll say, that's the very tip. Not here, not here, not here. That's the very tip. I'll have some patients that do this. Right, they miss it and then they self-correct. I'll say, okay, do it with the other. Boom, no problem. Do it with the right one again. And they miss and they self-correct. So that tells me that there's a lesion within their right cerebellum that's failing to coordinate the precision of the movement from the right half of the body. So I'll know how to treat them to activate the right cerebellum, to awaken the right cerebellum. So if I were to throw a ball to someone in the class and it goes over their head, I go, ooh, I use too much force, boom, my cerebellum, my frontal lobe of my brain is gonna initiate the action to throw the ball, but it's sending a photocopy message to the cerebellum. And the photocopy message knows to make a modification to how much strength and power I use to throw the ball. So it modifies it, okay? That's the importance of the cerebellum when someone gets pulled over by a police officer because of driving in and out and swerving out of lanes, that officer may think that you're driving under the influence, perhaps alcohol. So they will test, they will play neurologist. They're gonna say during a sobriety test, they're gonna say, take your finger to the tip of the nose, walk heel to toe, heel to toe to make sure that you have balance because if alcohol gets into the neural system, especially the cerebellum, you have no balance. You have no balance physically. You may speak like this, you have no balance and coordination to how you talk, right? It's even that type of skill, right? So balance and coordination of how you speak, balance and coordination of how you walk, balance and coordination of all your movements is cerebellum. So here's the right cerebellar hemisphere, the left cerebellar hemisphere, and right in the center 
is a region called the vermis. When we take the right and left cerebellar hemispheres and we divide them and we look at the inside of them, we can see it looks like a leaf, right? It looks like a leaf and the veins of a leaf. So the veins of the leaf is actually white matter. That's called the arbor vitae. What do you do on arbor day? You plant a tree. So this is, means literally tree of life. So here, the white matter on the inside, that's called the arbor vitae. And the gray matter on the outside is called folia, F-O-L-I. The folia is the cerebellar cortex. The word folia means foliage, like during autumn, the foliage, the leaves fall, that's foliage. So the veins of the leaf are arborvitae, the folia is the cerebellar cortex, that's gray matter on the outside. Okay, let's finish up here with the ventricles. When we look at the ventricles, we have two ventricles, lateral ventricle one and two that we can see in this view. Right over here in the middle is lateral, is a ventricle three and right down there at the bottom we could see the fourth ventricle so we have four ventricles in total these are the two lateral ventricles one in each hemisphere the rest are midline structures so here is lateral ventricles on both sides to get from lateral ventricle one and two the cerebral spinal fluid has to flow through this drain this drain is called the interventricular foramen of Monroe, the interventricular foramen of Monroe. It's got to go through the interventricular foramen of Monroe to get to the third ventricle, which is right here. That's the third ventricle. So here's your lateral ventricle. Here's your third ventricle. And this is blocking the interventricular foramen of Monroe. We really can't see it from this view. But here's the third ventricle. Now, how does the cerebral spinal fluid, the CSF, go to the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle? It's got to go through a drain called the cerebral aqueduct, sometimes called the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia or Silvis. And then after the fourth ventricle, it's going to exit through these other drains here, the lateral apertures or the median aperture. So down here, after the fourth ventricle, the CSF can go out through the lateral ventricles, or it can go down the median aperture. This median aperture is going to send the cerebral spinal fluid through the center of the spinal cord in an area called the central canal. Let me see if I can just show you quickly the central canal is right here. So here's the spinal cord. And right there is the central canal. We, so this CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is going and going to bathe the inside of the spinal cord. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and I'm gonna create another link for the spinal cord.